what scenes did you guys see from Sleeper Cell's pilot? Um, so that we saw the whole, whole, so the whole episode. Okay, uh, it's interesting because uh, when I saw that pilot, I, I was not involved in the pilot. Uh, I was it was created by two other gentlemen, uh, Ethan Reeve and Cyrus Voris, who were wonderful guys who were my bosses on the show, and uh, they were feature screenwriters who pitched the show and got it they got it made on Showtime. I was not involved in the pilot, and when I saw the pilot, uh, they were from a Muslim's point of view, and I'm Muslim. From a Muslim point of view, there's a lot of problematic stuff in there. And I said, guys, you know, you really need a Muslim voice on the show because there's errors about the religion, there's errors about uh, even the issue of how these terrorists work. And they brought me on, and uh, we're going to see episode four today, which really was a chance for me to talk about the differences between the mainstream religion of 1.5 billion people and what uh, Al Qaeda and various extremist groups like that are doing with it. But Sleeper Cell, as you can saw, as you saw from the pilot, is an unusual show. You know, you've got a Muslim guy who's a hero, and that's the first time we've seen that in American television. And, you know, you know, every now and then you'll have sort of the the sidekick who is the nameless, you know. Arab foreign agent who helps fight the terrorists on some show like Alias, right? But you know, but there's never any depth to what motivates that person, or or how they are in any way representative of their culture. And so, Sleeper Cell was really a revolutionary thing. It's been something that, you know, one of the reasons I left behind a career as a lawyer was to come to Hollywood to be involved in something like this, which is to talk about you know, the issues of mainstream Islam versus the images in the media of extremism. You know, it's. I mean, I don't know if there's any new Muslims in this in this class, but if you know any. You know, it's uh, it's very it's challenging in this particular moment in history to be a Muslim, especially in America. Is you know, growing up, I never ever 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 heard one good thing about my religion ever. It was two things you heard from childhood, and it's only gotten worse since then. But but from the late 70s, uh, I remember when the Iranian hostage crisis happened, and I was eight years old and going to elementary school. Suddenly, it was my fault, right? And that was my real big shock introduction, where the, where the kids would uh, gang up on you because it's you, it's people like you, were holding our people hostage. And uh, there you are, just wanting to go to school in elementary school. And the two things, obviously, that the image of Islam are that it is an extremely violent religion, extremely primitive religion, with stoning to death, the kind of things you saw in episode one of the pilot, and it's extremely misogynistic. And yet it's also with the second largest religion in the world and keeps growing. So that's a problematic thing. I mean, how could these two images be correct at the same time? And I would suggest that they're not correct. There's definitely uh, an element in modern Islam of violence, of misogyny, and of all those things. But it is not the experience of the Islam of the vast majority of us. And so, you know, it's very challenging to be raised in an environment where it's a media-saturated environment, where the only images you get of your faith that you're living every day and practicing, you're coming home to your parents who belong to it and they're very happy with it, and this is the only image the world has. So that was what I chose to challenge while I left behind my career as a lawyer, because I knew I could write. I thought, okay, I'm going to take a big risk here and and, uh, and jump into this Hollywood thing that's a little crazy, and I can tell you some Hollywood stories afterwards. Um, but Sleeper Cell was really an ideal project for me because it gave me a chance to talk about these issues for the first time. So that's just my little introductory spiel. Do you guys have some questions about based on what you saw in the pilot? Because we're going to go to episode four. It's very, very different from the pilot. You'll see what my involvement as a believer did to the show. It's really a, it's a quantum leap and a change. So, yeah. and my question is, is that like as an avenue for like Muslims to get like both like get their side out? Is it a big problem that the only way to do that is to have it like? At well, the I mean, same it, time. it was. It, it it is a natural problem. I mean, prior to really this generation, people like myself. I'm not the only Muslim in Hollywood. There's a few others, and there's quite a few that are coming. Uh, but I'm one of the first. And prior to us, uh, it was really a situation where people who wanted to, who were Muslim, who wanted to be in Hollywood, the only gigs they could get was on the terror shows. I have a lot of actor friends. Some of them have been working from since the early '80s. Uh, a friend of mine, Saeed Badria, he has the great pride of being the first Arab terrorist played by an Arab. Because before they would have Greek guys play the Arab terrorist. <laughs> because they were only the Arabs in the business. And so you get like a Greek guy or an Italian guy who sort of looks a little swarthy, and you give him a gun, he goes, Allah Akbar. And you know, it's like, oh, now these, like, you got the first guy who was an Arab got to play an Arab. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it, it is, it is, on one level, it gave a lot of people work and gave them an introduction to this town at a time when there were no other voices. Uh, who could cater to the community. So, you know, on that level, it's a, it's the first and perhaps natural step. When you don't have Muslims making the decision, they're not, at that at least at that time, were not producers, they weren't executives in the in movie studios and television studios. The natural thing is you've got these people that appear to be fighting our culture. They're very easy bad guys. We don't really have to understand what motivates them. We you know, just have to make them talk in an unusual language and fire guns, and it'll be enough. And that's the first step. Um, it is, I will admit, unsatisfying for most of us that had to go through that first step because we felt it's, it's a little like being prostituted out and you know you're just like okay I'm just 
I'm letting myself do this and degrade myself um, being by being involved in this kind of material. Because especially, you know, because the first wave were actors. And actors, um, for any of you who have a desire to be an actor, acting is a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, but it's a powerless job, right? You know, it is, it, your, your, your control is made by the people writing the scripts and financing the production. So if you want to do the role, you do what it says. Unless you're Tom Cruise, then you have some leverage over changing the script. Uh, but so the actors who were the first wave of Muslims in this town faced a tremendous amount of, okay, this is the script. You go in there, you kill these kids, and then you pray towards Mecca. So you had to take it or you leave it, you take it or leave it. And that was what they had. And most of them ended up taking it uh, with some level of shame. And then, you know, then now when, when I did Sleeper Cell, and especially when episode four came out, uh, which you'll see today, uh, it was really this wondrous moment where, where we did the casting sessions and dozens and dozens of Arab and Muslim actors came in for the roles. And each of them was just saying that they had never seen a script like that in which there had been a beautiful portrayal of Islam. They'd never in their 20 years acting ever seen one. They all went out to comment on it. it to them, it was a, a quantum leap and a shift in the mindsets. And there's, there's others that are coming. We had to go through that phase. But uh, I think that that phase is no longer satisfying. Of course, I mean, there are many, many Islamic extremist terrorists out there. They're out there, and they really do want to attack Western civilization. And so they're, uh, they are a perfectly valid enemy or adversary to have in entertainment, because they're real. Uh, but now it's the time to talk about, OK, they're real, but what percentage of this vast civilization are they? And what aspects of this vast civilization are we not seeing? Because one of the um, many, you know, I have certain specific political views, uh, which you know, I will talk about personally afterwards, but I specifically look at the situation in Iraq right now. And a, one way to look at it is that the reason many people bought <coughs> on to this current strategy, which I think <coughs> there's a growing consensus on both sides of the political aisle, this strategy in the Middle East isn't working, if you can identify what the strategy is. Uh, it's, people bought into it because they believed that this was an, an, um, a mindless alien other. If you drop bombs on it, it will surrender. Right? It's, they're not really human beings like us because people have been raised on that generation of media from childhood on that this is an adversary that has no agenda, it has no humanity. It's like the Borg from Star Trek, right? Just, you know, they'll keep fighting us until either we win or we're assimilated, right? So with people believing that, there was very little uh, effort to, to, you know, for people to even say, you know, would this action in the Middle East and Iraq, would this actually lead to the outcome that we expect and think? And I was recently talking to a close friend of mine who was a very, very strong supporter of the current administration strategy until recently when he began to say, you know, maybe it's not working. And his view was, well, I didn't know. i had been raised to believe these guys were just stupid barbarians. If we gave them democracy and we gave them a few, bombed a few of them back to, the, to common sense, they would accept the, that Western civilization is the future. And uh, when it didn't play out that way, uh, he was shocked because that is what the power of the media had. He had been raised to believe certain things about these people. So he would go along with government actions against these people. And if they didn't work out the way he expected, he didn't know it didn't fit into his paradigm of how things should be. So that's the danger of, of the of that stage we went through. Because it, it, it told a whole generation of Americans, several generations, what Arabs and Muslims are all about, inaccurately, to lead to bad policy decisions, in my opinion. So that long, long, long spiel will answer here, please. Do you think there are shows in production now with Muslim lawyers and doctors and nurses and teachers? There's, it, it's beginning to come. I mean, I've heard of a couple of things. You know, it's the, fir the first wave was Sleeper Cell, which had the Muslim hero, which we've never seen. Okay? The next wave that I expected to come and it's been to happen is sort of the, the Muslim sitcom, the funny, the funny uh, immigrant guy who comes to live with the American family. Right? That's coming. That's actually coming. There's a couple of those in production. There's one in Canada, which is actually doing very well. Called uh, called Little Mosque on the Prairie, and uh, it's uh, and yeah, you know that's and that's that's a good that's the next stage of it because when at first people fear something, then they use humor to overcome their fears, and then they can look at drama. It's a it's a stage that most minorities go through. The African American community were first just the villainous criminals and every and everything. Then you had Cosby, you had a little bit of comedy, so people go, oh, these people are real human beings. They can laugh, they joke, they have stories, and then you can go to a movie like Malcolm X, which is a pure drama set in the African American community. And you know, it, it takes <coughs> mainstream culture, I think, these three stages. So first you have the villain, then you have the comedy, so you can laugh at these people. Because when you're laughing at somebody, there's still a little a, a, a feeling of superiority towards them and a feeling of distance. And then finally the drama where you see these people have problems just like you do. And they're struggling to pay their bills and they're human beings. That is a third level of empathy. We're not there yet. I'm gonna try to take a step. <laughs> 